Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship today as we celebrate uh, on this Labor Day weekend the blessing of uh, God's touching us with both His Word and also as He does through the instruments of His grace, especially we're going to focus today a little bit on His sacraments because of the sacramental kind of touch He had in our gospel lesson with the uh, man who uh, was deaf. And so we're going to think a little bit about that uh, today as we uh, celebrate the love life that we have in our Jesus. So warm welcome to all of you, both members and guests, as we gather. We ask that you would fill out one of the connection cards for us so that um, uh, we can uh, effectively do our shepherding here at uh, St. John's. We really appreciate your help with that. Uh, as we worship this morning, we'll be following the order of service that uh, you picked up once again. Um, and we just have a number of announcements. We do have a voters assembly that's coming up at the end of this month, and so we'd like to have you put that on your schedule. It'll be right after uh, our uh, worship service on the last Sunday of the month. The, um, the other thing some people have been asking for is uh, Brian Schnacke's contact information. And so if you noticed last week and again this week, you have that in your uh, bulletin, so if you'd like to reach out to him, uh, uh, we encourage you to do it through the contact information he's provided. Well, let's uh, worship our Lord. We begin today with uh, uh, a hymn that's kind of focused on our gospel with To Our World of Savior Cain. from above and for our sake. 
salvation, let us pray to the Lord.
Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, and the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a, and, and a highway will be there. It'll be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast, for they'll not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. They'll enter Zion with singing. Oh, everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from um, uh, the book of, of James. And in this particular uh, uh, section, it's one of those places that's sometimes confusing for people because of the way James uses the word faith. And when James uses the word faith, unlike Paul, he's only talking about do I know something and do I say yes it's true? And to this kind of faith, he'll say even the demons can have that kind of faith. And so he says uh, that kind of faith also needs to show itself. Uh, and, and it shows itself by relying on God's love and by acting in God's ways. And so uh, he encourages us to have the fruits of faith in this section. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Now suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, well, have a, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you, stand there, or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But you show favoritism, you sin. You're convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law against stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's rise and join in the gospel preparation verse. <laughs> Which means be open. And this the man's ears were open and his tongue was loosened. 
And he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He's done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. It looks like Carter, you're the one and only one to come up with a children's lesson today. <laughs> Savior, to with your body, to with your body, 
Speak your word. Speak your word. And touch those in need of healing. And touch those in need of healing. Touch my heart. Touch my heart. Through your word. Through your word. And for, through the gifts. And through the gifts. Of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Of baptism and the Lord's Supper. So that I'm assured. So that I'm assured. Of how deeply and fully. Of how deeply and fully. You love me. You love me. Set it in its context. 
we're going to cover two miracles, not just the one that we read, but also the one just before the healing of the Syrophoenician woman's uh, daughter. And, and the question we're asking ourselves today is this one, have you been healed by Jesus through his word and work? Or maybe better yet for us, as we make our journey life through life, are you being healed by Jesus' word and work? Um, is your heart open? Are your ears open? Is your life open for that particular gift that Jesus gives? As I said, there, there are two lessons here. One is the Syrophoenician woman who comes uh, to Jesus. He, he had gone up to Tyre and Sidon to get away. And and when he went up to Tyre and Sidon to get away, what he did is uh, this woman came to him and she said, Jesus, uh, would you heal my daughter? She's demon possessed. And um, you remember that was kind of a, it's kind of a difficult interchange. It sounds like Jesus is being kind of rude. Because when she asks, he says to her that, um, that it's one way for him to say that he came to the lost sheep of Israel first and, and primarily. And he says to her, well, you know, I came for the lost sheep of Israel. You don't give to the dogs what belongs to the children. And this is where she has this marvelous response where she says, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. In other words, uh, Jesus, all I want is crumbs. And I trust that your crumbs are going to do what I need to do. And, and Jesus, you know, responds by saying to, to her, uh, I haven't seen such faith in all of Israel. And he says, go, your daughter's healed. And when she goes home, she finds out that in the very moment that he said, your daughter's healed, he then came. Now, what did Jesus use? to heal this little girl, just his word. And it wasn't just his word, but it was his word at a different distance. The girl didn't even know that Jesus had said this. He wasn't in her presence. And when we see Jesus doing work with his word, we see how powerful it is. It's got long distance power. We, we see in a couple of other places, there's two other instances where Jesus heals somebody this way. One is in, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew when, when a centurion comes and says, Jesus, come heal my servant. And, and he just says to him, go, let it be done, just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed in that very hour. In the Gospel of John, in the fourth chapter, it's not a, a, a soldier, it's a royal official who comes to Jesus and says, please heal my servant and my child, my son. He says, come down, I need you to come with me. He invites him to be personally present, to lay his hands on that son and to bring him healing, and Jesus just says, go, your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said, started on his way. When he got home, he too found out that his son was healed in that very same hour. Now those are long distance kind of healings just with the word of Jesus. His word has that power. But you and I know there were many times when he was in the presence of the person that he healed. Where he just used his word. Where he said to the man who was born, they get up and walk. And the man, it tells us immediately, he felt uh, life coming to his legs. And he got up and he walked. Even when it comes to raising the dead, you know, there's, uh, of course, in John chapter 11, that time when Jesus is standing outside the tomb of Lazarus, who's been buried now for four days, and says, Lazarus, come out. And with his word, the dead man starts walking. But in another case, when Jairus comes to get Jesus because his daughter was in need of healing, and then they come and say, don't bother the teacher, she's already dead. Jesus says she's not dead, she's sleeping. It tells us he goes into the room with Peter, Johnson, James, and John. He takes her by the hand and says to the little girl, I say to you, arise. 
Sometimes there's a touch, and sometimes there's not. And, and this is one of the things that uh, we see repeated in Scripture. It, it's, it's kind of a strange thing, because you might ask yourself this question. Well, if Jesus just can heal with his word, why does he touch anybody? Why does he use anything? Why would he choose to touch somebody or, in the case of our text today, spit? Why would he do that? Well, let's just think a little bit about that. So today we've got a man who is, is deaf. Jesus is left now, tired of sight. He'd gone away, hopefully that people wouldn't recognize him. He'd have a little alone time. But this woman recognized him and experienced the healing for her daughter. Now, he comes back into the Decapolis. That's just the Greek word for ten cities, Deca and Polis. The Decapolis is ten cities in Galilee where Jesus uh, uh, traveled and, and taught and healed. And now he's confronted by a man who is deaf. We don't know in what circumstances, but Jesus does two things. He doesn't just speak. In fact, his word comes after his actions. The first thing he does is he puts his fingers, it tells us, into the man's ears. Then it tells us he spits on his hand and puts the spit on the man's tongue. And then it says he looks up to heaven and he says those words, Ephraim, or be open. Now why? And this isn't the first or only time that Jesus used to spit, as I said, the children's lesson in, in uh, Mark 8, just a chapter later, we find a man who's blind. And you remember in this situation, Jesus spit on the man's eyes. And then he said, what do you see? And the man said, I see things like tree trunks moving around. And then Jesus this is a staged healing, which is a really kind of strange one. He does it again, and the man says, no, I can see clearly. Or there's the time in the Gospel of John. You remember uh, the healing of this blind man? He didn't spit in the eyes. Instead, he picked up some dirt. He spat in it. He made some mud. He put the mud on the man's eyes, and he said, now go wash in the pool of salt. So when I get to heaven, this is one of the questions I'm going to ask Jesus. Why did you spit? Why? These three miracles, why did you spit? Why did you use something instead of nothing? And, and this is something that we see sometimes uh, throughout Scripture. You, you remember back in the days of Moses, Moses twice got water from a rock. The first time, God told him to take the rod of Aaron and strike the rock. And water gushed, and all the people of Israel were able to get what they needed. The second time, he told them, speak to the rock. And Moses instead struck the rock. <laughs> In effect, not listening to God, but using that, that staff of Aaron kind of like a, a magic tool. And uh, it was for that reason that Moses wasn't able to go into the promised land because of his disobedience to God. But in one case, God had told him, use a means, use a staff. And the other one, he said, just speak the word. And this kind of leads us to the question about why Jesus would use some instrument, whether it's laying hands on him as he did sometimes, whether it's spit, whether it's mud. And that's the power of, of touch. Dr. Dr. Keltner, he's a professor of psychology and a scientific advisor for Fix, uh, Pixar's film Inside Out. And uh, one of his claims in one of his articles is that human touch is uh, the foundation of human relationship. He explains skin to skin, parent to child, touch is the social language of our social life. The foundation of all human relationship is touch. There are four years of touch exchanged between mother and baby. In the social realm, our social awareness is profoundly tactile. Let's do a touch. I think about sometimes when I've seen uh, mothers who have had premature children and how both the mother and the father would do, I think they call it kangaroo, where they 
uh, will put the child directly against the mother's or father's skin. And, and how significant they found that that kind of touch has been for, uh, for children to do well. well. Uh, this particular professor of psychology was also one of the co-authors for a study that looked at celebratory touches of pro basketball players, including fist bumps, high fives, chest bumps, leaping shoulder bumps, chest punches, head slaps, head grabs, low fives, high tens, full hugs, half hugs, and team hugs. And maybe you've seen this in football too, where grown men will hold hands, whether they're in the huddle or whether they're on the side. And what the researchers discovered is that teams whose players touched one another did a lot better than those teams whose players did not. And he's concluded that touch lowers stress, it builds morale, it produces triumphs. A chest bump instructs us as in cooperation, a half hug in compassion. In other words, the power of touch is profound. You think Jesus knew that? I think our God knows that very, very, very well. And so he's not only given us his word to speak his love and grace into our life, but he's also given us sacraments. And, and when we think about sacraments, what is it? Well, a sacrament has to have three things in order to be a sacrament in our church. It has to be, first of all, ordained or, or, or originated in God. He has to say, do this. Second thing is it has to have a visible means. There you go, something that touches. And the third thing is someplace in the Bible it's got to say very clearly, when you do this thing that I've told you to do with the instrument I've told you to use it, forgiveness comes to you. And of course there are two like that. And that's uh, baptism of the Lord's Supper. Well, what makes uh, baptism of the Lord's Supper valid or effective? It's not the person of the minister, right? Some people think it has to be a priest or a pastor. It's, that's uh, not a biblical position. The action by itself, just going through the motions, does that make it valid or effective? No. Does the faith of the recipient, it's what I believe that makes a difference? And the answer, no. What it is, it's the word promise of God. And I've used this example before. I'll just use it again. If, when I'm teaching about this, I, I take out a bill for my wallet. Sometimes I got a hundred dollar bill. I say, what is this? And I'll say, it's a hundred dollar bill. And I'll say, no, it's just a piece of paper with ink on it. That's all it is. In its essence, what is it? It's a piece of paper with ink on it. What gives it its value? Well, there's a promise on this bill that says this is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Who put that promise there? The United States government. And it doesn't depend on whether I believe that promise or not. That bill is worth $100, not because of what I say, but because of what the United States government says. And when I think about this in terms of, of baptism, you know, Luther says, what is baptism? It's just simple water. But it's water that's connected with and comprehended in the Word of God. In other words, God's put his promise behind it. And, and it's something that... that provides a tangible touch in your and my life. What's the Lord's Supper? Well, it's just bread and wine. But it's bread and wine that connected and comprehended in God's word tells us that Christ's body and blood are truly present in with another that bread and wine. And this is something God has used throughout history. You know, from the very beginning, God spoke his word of grace into this world. But eventually he added signs. He added something physical, tangible. In Abraham's day, it was circumcision. But of course, only boys got circumcised. When John the Baptist came along, baptism was added uh, to some of the other ritual washings that were not commanded in the Bible, but that the Jews of his time did. But it gave, was given special meaning as God promised them. Uh, forgiveness of sins and through this touch. And then, of course, Jesus established his supper. A supper for you and I to participate in where, again, uh, he touches us. And when we think about, then, the difference between the healing that comes through the word and the healing that comes through the touch, the healing that comes through the word is very often very public. Okay? 
What I mean by that? How many people are here today? Right? My voice, as I'm preaching, is hitting all of your words. Am I hitting all of you where you need to be hit? Well, some people will say, well, Pastor, you missed the mark today. I say, just wait. Because God's word has a funny way. If it's not applicable to you today, to prepare you for something that's coming. And, and, and so it's very public, though. I, I always like to say it's kind of like a shotgun, you know? The problem is somebody out there might be, because of whatever is going on in their life, kind of say, miss me. But you can't say that when it comes to the, to the sacraments. It's more like going hunting with a, a rifle. You use a rifle with a skull, because you've got to get just that one. And, and it's very personal. And when you and I were baptized, nobody else's head got wet, unless there were other people being baptized on that same day. And when you and I come to the Lord's Supper, it's, it's in that moment when God says, this is my body broken for you, this is my blood shed for you. I like to say they're God's hugs. It's where he not only speaks to us with his word, but he also touches us in very tangible ways to let us know that this is personal, that he doesn't mean it for somebody else in that moment, moment he means it for you. Another way to think about the, the, the reason why Jesus would use some kind of means to communicate his grace to us is just thinking a little bit about our senses and about how we receive information. And when we think about the word, we can say, well, first of all, I can read it, right? Or I can hear it. But it touches those two senses. When I'm baptized, I hear the word and I see what's going on, but I also feel the water. <coughs> it adds that sensation. When I come to the Lord's Supper, I not only see the word, hear the word, I not only can touch, but I also can taste and mm -hmm. I can smell. And God involves all the senses so that you and I never have to be afraid of whether he's spoken to us directly. And, and what is he speaking to us? Well, he's speaking to us the grace of our Jesus who went to the cross for you and for me to die for all of our sins and to fill us with his spirit so that we can move out into this world in the power and promise of that grace. And when we were baptized, he said, I want you for my child. And this forgiveness is yours. And baptism has that power because of God's word. Now, whether I get the benefit of it is on whether I believe it. Just like whether I get the benefit of that $100 bill is whether I believe it and actually go use it. And when you and I are living in our baptismal faith, dying and rising again through confessing our sins and receiving God's grace on a regular basis, we are living in the reality of God's grace to us in baptism. And every time we come to the Lord's Supper and he says, this is my body given for you, this is my blood poured out for you, he wraps us again in that grace in a very tangible and touchable way. Why did he use spit? I don't know. But I do know that Jesus used tangible, touchable means accompanied by his word to reach into the lives and bring healing to people who were in need. And he still does today. In your and my life, not only through his word, but also through the gifts that he gives us in the sacraments, the sacramental words. And, and then he sets us free to be those kind of people in the lives of others, you know, one of the things that's true about this pandemic is that there's been a major increase. doesn't matter if you go on Mayo Clinics or any of the other uh, medical um, websites. And they'll tell you that there have been a major increase in the number of U.S. adults who report systems of stress, anxiety, and depression, especially depression. The number of suicides has gone up. The number of people trying to cope by the use of uh, alcohol and drugs has increased significantly. And in reality, these things often, um, especially the drugs and alcohol, can worsen anxiety and depression rather than help. 
And it makes sense because some people have experienced things like the loss of a job, the death of a loved one, or some other financial stress because there was a layoff or a shutdown for a period of time. And we know that it's still true with the usual demographic uh, trends that women tend to be more depressed than men, and single people are more likely to experience depression than married couples because we were built for community and we were built for connections. And, and, and so one of the things that you and I can do as people who have been embraced by Jesus, not just by his word, but also by his touch, is to think and, and plan ways that we can reach out to others, especially in this particular situation in and time in our lives. To make con connections with people who might be socially isolated. To find time to connect, whether it's by uh, emails or texts or phone calls or FaceTime or whatever you might use. If you're working remotely yet, to still connect with uh, co-workers or with family members. Um, we've had a, a number of birthdays in our family. We have been able to celebrate in person. And, you know, it's no fun being able to do that because of, of some of the COVID stuff. Um, it's reaching out and do something for others, maybe helping them get their meal or, or checking if they need groceries or but especially thinking of those people who are in our sphere of relationship that might be going through a difficult time. We know the power of both word and touch to bring healing and, and hope to our hearts. And Jesus calls us in this moment to bring healing and touch to those in our, our world, to continue to open hearts to his grace and his love. That is, you have been healed by Jesus through his word and work, that you can be his healing agent in this world. I, I remember um, uh, going to a funeral over in Emmanuel that officiated death, and um, one person after the, uh, the funeral, when they came up to me and still COVID back and gave me a hug. And then I got an email later and said, you know, that's the first hug I get. how precious that was. And I've heard people say that I miss hugs. I miss that touch. So let's be sensitized to, uh, to touching the lives of others with the grace that God gives us so that they feel Jesus healing touch through us. Would you rise and let me pray that? Lord Jesus, we just thank and praise you that that you affirm, not only with your word, but with your touch, your grace to us, that your death on the cross applies to us, that the life that you embraced when you rose from the grave is also ours by faith. And we just ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts to see those places where we can share that healing touch with others. We ask it uh, for your sake. Now may that peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds from faith in Jesus, life everlasting. Amen. Let's confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of From Isaiah chapter 32. See, a king will reign in righteousness, and rulers will rule with justice. Each one will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm. Like streams of water in the desert, and the shadow of the great rock in the thirsty land.
the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed, and the ears of those who hear will listen. The fearful heart will know and understand, and the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. Let's remain standing as we dedicate our offerings with the offering response, which shall I render to the Lord. <laughs> Chelsea, 
Marin and Crosby Hope. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, now remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us